Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Cam and the team are going to be leading us in worship. I'll be back after that to bring the next message in our series from the book of Joshua. And then following that, Danny Hunt is here to lead us in a time of communion together. It's going to be a great church service today. Hope you're excited. Church starts now. and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long.
held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in all for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now the gospel truth the hope shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and by his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, free in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise the Father, praise Well, good day, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to share as part of our ongoing series in the book of Joshua. You know, I just, I really love speaking from stories uh, in the Old Testament. And today we're looking at a real good one with the victory at Jericho. Now, in case you missed any of the messages in this series or are unfamiliar with the story, let's do a quick recap of what's been happening with God's people. I think of this as like that previously on section that often kicks off your favorite TV show. So Joshua begins with the people of God on the verge of entering the promised land. And Moses, the one who led the people out of slavery through the wilderness and to the border of promise, has now passed the mantle of leadership onto young Joshua. And if you're interested in that, you know, check out the first two messages in the series as both Pastor Tom and I uh, cover all of that from Joshua's commissioning to navigating the unknown to passing the baton. And what happens next is something that we haven't quite covered yet in our messages, but it has definite impact on today's message. Uh, once Joshua's passed the mantle of leadership, one of the first things he does is he sends two men to spy out the land, especially, he says, pay special attention to the city of Jericho. And these two spies head into the land and they find lodging in the home of Rahab and soon find themselves pursued by the king of Jericho. Now Rahab, she chose to hide the spies and aid them in escape, confiding in Joshua's men that she knows the Lord has given God's people the land and that fear has fallen upon all of the inhabitants. Her aid, though, it comes with a little bit of a deal when she says, when you come to take the land, please spare my life and the lives of my family members, just as I have helped to spare your lives here today. Now, the spies, they uh, successfully escape. They report back to Joshua. Uh, and we see that at the end of Joshua chapter 2, where they say, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Now, this brings us to the message that Pastor, Sean, Pastor Tom just shared last week. The people of God led by Joshua, crossed the River Jordan in a miraculous fashion. And once all the people have crossed, they pause to build an altar and renew their covenant with God. For they have finally entered the promised land. And then we come today to Jericho. And, you know, from the manner and frequency in which it is referred to, it would seem to have been probably the most important city in the Jordan Valley at that time and the most intimidating. We're talking about a walled city with walls about 12 feet high, six feet thick, 
covering uh, the walls encircled an area of about 40, uh, 40 to 50,000 square meters, would have been about a two kilometer walk around the walled city. Jericho was to be the first big test for the people of God. You know, they think about this. They have been told that God is with them. They've been told that the land has been given into their hands, but now, now is the time for action. Will all that they have been told hold true? As they walk out what has been asked of them, will they meet with success or failure? And these are, these are real questions. I can't imagine that God's people weren't grappling with these thoughts as they looked upon the walled city of Jericho. And I'm sure those watching today have grappled with the same questions in your own life. I know I, know I have in my own life. Will the things that God has spoken hold true when life gets real? Will it be success or failure as I step out in faith? When the time for action arrives, what is going to happen? So we're going to dive into the story real quick. But first, before we do that, let's just pray. Let's just invite God's presence. Let's just open our hearts to hear what he would say. God, thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I pray that as we look uh, to this account of Jericho, to what you asked of your people, to what happened in the moments after that, God, I pray that we would uh, see what you were speaking to us that we would see the truth that you were revealing in your word and that they would not just be ancient th- uh, truths for a people long ago, but there'd be things that we could actively apply to our lives today that would lead us and guide us in what we are facing now. I ask this, I pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, so Joshua chapter six is where you'll find the account of Jericho. So let's all turn there together. And, and as, we, as I read this, and we're going to read all of the story today. I'm going to break it up into a few different parts. We're going to read the entire text today. I would just ask you to, to picture what's happening with me. Maybe, you know, close your eyes and try to picture it in your mind's eye. Uh, maybe you're, you're artistic and want to sketch it out as we go along, but do what you can to picture along with me the events that are transpiring before us. So Joshua chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says this. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. No one went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days." Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march on the city, and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. Verse 8. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about at once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Verse 12, then Joshua rose early in the morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on and they blew the trumpets continually and the armed men were walking before them and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched from the city once and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. Let's pause there. We're going we're gonna to look at our first big idea for the day, which is this. Victory in obedience. The walls of Jericho fell. The city was captured because the people followed the Lord's instructions. God didn't say, I've given in Jericho into your hand. Have at her. Do whatever you want. You know, it's yours. You just you figure it out. Have fun. And he didn't just snap his fingers 
and do the work for them. We know he could do that. God could have said, city's yours, snap, walls fall down. Instead, God promised his people the victory and laid out specific instructions as to how it would come about. Obedience is what took down the city of Jericho. Now that sounds simple, right? But I don't want us to miss the depths of what's happening here. If you're tasked with taking down an ancient city surrounded by walls of a thickness and height never seen before, what would your strategy be? Now, I'm no military commander, but I would think, you know, uh, heavy artillery might be called for, uh, maybe an airstrike or two, maybe just hoping for an earthquake to just miraculously happen and, and suck the city into the ground. But what does God ask them to do? He's not asking them to bring out the artillery. He's not asking them to call in the ancient airstrike. He's not promising an earthquake. God asks them to march around the city once a day for six days in a row. Trumpets blowing, the word says trumpets blowing continually, would would have been quite the sound, but not a word to be heard. And I picture that in my head, just the army of God walking around the city, just not a peep. Nobody saying anything, just trumpets blowing continually. That's what they were asked to do. And then on the seventh day, march on the city seven times. And once you've done that, and only once you've done that, you signal the people that now is the time to shout. And no fighting. Did you notice that? Nowhere in his instructions was there anything about fighting or engaging the inhabitants. Basically, God's saying, you're not going to need that to take the city, which seems a little counterintuitive to how someone would set up the conquest or the taking of a city. You know, in the end, this doesn't sound like a military strategy. It sounds like a very strange parade. Victory in obedience is a simple and easy principle on paper. But then we begin to realize that obedience to the Lord often runs counter to what would seem to make the most sense. And we see this throughout Scripture, right? Where it tells us to give, and it will be given to you. Where we're told to humble yourself, and you will be exalted. To love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or in the sake of today's text, to take the city with trumpets and shouting. There's this pattern of God asking something of us that seems to run counter to what we would expect. And you know, I think we're really good at obedience when it makes sense and follows the pattern we expect it to. I'm not sure we're as good with obedience when it runs counter to what we expect or puts us into an awkward position or doesn't adhere to our timeline. Remember, seven days of marching, not March once and it happens. Seven days of marching. Wake up, walk around the city once, head back to camp, rinse and repeat for the rest of the week. This type of obedience is a lot tougher to swallow. You know, the type of obedience that that seems counterintuitive, the type of obedience where success is not immediately promised or achieved, the type of obedience that requires something of us. But this This type of obedience is where the victory lies. So I ask us today, when faced with a challenge or a test, do you seek God's direction or do you just go with your gut? If he says left and your gut says right, which way do you choose? Can I encourage you today that we need to be seeking God's direction? We need to be seeking God's instructions. And once we've sought after that, we need to obey what he's asking of us. All the best things in our lives are planted along the road of obedience. There is victory in obedience. Now, as we continue on in the account, head with me back to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 15. It says, On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of day, and marched from the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched from the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. 
But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout. And the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they, then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. Let's pause there. Because this right here is where, for some people, we run into a challenge. You know, there's no way around the reality of what God is asking his people to do. I'm sure you caught that, that phrase, devoted to destruction. Some text would put set apart as an offering to the Lord. God is asking his people to wipe out everything in the city. And we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with this? How can a good and loving God ask such a thing of his people? And, and how can we be okay with it? Should we be okay with it? You know, first off, this is why historical and cultural context is so incredibly important when reading the Bible. What we read here today in regards to the, 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 the devoting the city, and devoting the things in the city to destruction, this is not God's direction to the church in North America in 2021. This was God's instruction to his people at a time in history where conquest and violence was a part of the culture. You know, what seems abhorrent by today's standard was considered an acceptable practice of the day. Now, that, that may not make sense to us looking back from where we stand currently in culture and in time and space, but we have to place this story within the historical and cultural context which, which it took place. And here is the key thing. The instructions to Israel to annihilate the Canaanites were specific in time, in intent, and in geography. I hope you heard me on that. This, the instructions to annihilate the Canaanites were specific in time, intent, and geography. God's people were not given blanket permission to do the same thing to any people they encountered at any time or in any place. It was limited to the crucial time when Israel was establishing itself as a theocracy under God. And he never asked this of his people again. Specific in time, intent, and geography. And the reason why I'm camping out here for a minute or two, because I think sometimes as Christians, we're still trying to wage war against the world around us. We're still trying to conquer the culture and wipe out that which doesn't line up with our view of Christianity. But everything changed when Jesus showed up, remember? We're not called to, to wipe out people or culture. We're not called to wipe those things off the face of the earth. Instead, we are called to go into all the earth and share the good news of Jesus Christ, to proclaim that God is for people and he, that he loves people and that he has mercy on people. So when we come to troubling passages in the Old Testament like this one, we need to remember the context in which it's rooted, the limited scope of the command, and the fact that our call is to bring people to Jesus, not to push them away or wipe them out. And that brings us to and actually really sets up quite well the last section of the Jericho account today. So grab your Bibles once again. We're going to head back into chapter 6, picking up in verse 22. It says, But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father, and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and, and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Verse 26, Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all 
the land. We come back around to Rahab and her family. Remember, remember them from our recap earlier. Rahab and her family saved alive from the destruction of Jericho. There is redemption in the rubble, which is our second big idea for today. There is redemption in the rubble. When everything burns down around you, my experience is that we tend to default to one of two options. The first option is the one where we we shut down. I'm done. Can't do it. My life is over. I'm out. I'm just going to sit here in the midst of the rubble and just cancel. I'm done. Finished. The second option that we often go to is where we try and rebuild what was lost. You know, I, I can do this. I can, I can rebuild. Where's the glue? It'll be as good as new. I can get back what was lost. Just give me some time. I'll rebuild what's been lost, what's been torn down. Interestingly, though, and I hope you caught it, in the context of today's narrative, Joshua gives explicit instructions not to rebuild what has come down. Going so far as to lay an oath cursing any man that tries to rebuild Jericho. You know, nothing good in store. There is nothing good in store for those who try and rebuild what God has torn down. But thankfully, God offers us a third option. And that third option is this. It's redemption. Being saved from something and for something. God spared Rahab and her family from the fall of Jericho. You know, they should have been devoted to destruction along with everything else. But because she hid the spies when they came to her, because she acknowledged God as the one true God in her exchange with them, she and her family lived. And not only did they live, but they were used by God. If you go ahead to the New Testament, you're going to find her name in some very key places. In Matthew chapter 1, Rahab is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 11, She is commended for her faith. She's held up as an example of what faith looks like. God had a plan for her life. He used her. He used her to bring about the, the earthly birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He used her as an example of what faith looks like. He extended her grace and her family and spared them from the destruction. I don't want us to miss what I believe God is speaking to us right now in this passage. You know, for many of us, we're going to look back on this last year. We're just going to see a big smoldering pile of rubble. March 2020, pandemic hit. Everything came crashing down. You know, here we are, June 2021, just over a year later, post-pandemic life on the horizon, restart plan in effect. I think God is asking us right now, what option are you choosing? Are you just going to shut down? After this year, you know, it's been, it's been too much. I can't go on. I'm just going gonna, just gonna to give up. It's just been too much. Are you going to try and, and rebuild the past? You know, let's get everything back to the way it was before March 2020. We can just, we'll just reset back to what life was like before all this hit. Or are you going to grab hold of the grace extended in this present moment and walk into the redemptive future that God has in store for you and in store for me? Remember, saved from something and for something. Will you find redemption in the rubble of this past year? Will you embrace the new things that he is looking to do as we walk out of the rubble into what he has for us? Whether that's in your own life, in our church, in our world, in our society, are you willing to walk out of the rubble into the new redemptive future that he has in store for you? You know, one of the reasons why I love Old Testament narrative so much is because I see so much of our own spiritual journeys reflected in the experience of the Israelites. You know, from slavery to promise, from mountaintop to exile, we face these very same ups and downs, starts and stops in our own walk with God, which leads me to look for the lesson, the the spiritual truth, the, you know, that that nugget of, of principle that's worth holding on to in each and every account. So when it comes to Jericho, God probably isn't going to ask you to march around your neighborhood until the houses fall down. You know, but he is going to ask you to follow his instructions. And they may not always align with what you think makes sense. 
You know, when you come up against a test or a challenge, he's, he, he's faithful. He'll, he'll give you the roadmap to get through that and to get over it and to find the way through. But it may not always align with what your gut says or the way that you think you should be doing it. And in those moments, we need to remind ourselves of this truth. There is victory in obedience. Success in life comes from obedience to God, to his word and to his ways. In the same way, you know, God probably isn't going to mark your neighborhood for destruction, sparing only you and your family. I'm really hopeful he's not going to do that. But there will be moments in life when it seems as though everything has fallen apart or is falling apart around you. You know, maybe it's relationship related. Maybe it's career related. Maybe it's completely out of your control at this past year. It just seems like the world has fallen apart around us. In those moments, we need to remind ourselves of this truth, that there is redemption in the rubble, that there is grace to move forward, that there is a good future ahead of us. Redemption is waiting. This is the God who we serve. This is who, is who Jesus is. In the midst of all that we've gone through in the past year, this is the truth that is worth holding on to. In a moment, we're going to take communion together as a church, which I think is really fitting following this message. But before we do that, I want to extend just an invitation to anyone watching today who has yet to make the decision for Jesus to be a part of your life. I want to extend that invitation to you. It's as simple as just saying, God, my, my, life, my life is a pile of rubble right now and I need to grab hold of this grace you're extending. I want to walk in the redemption that you're offering. I want you to be a part of my life and pull me out of where it seems like everything has fallen apart and help me to walk into the, the good future you have in store for me. If that's you, would you just pray along with me today? Jesus, I thank you for your grace extended. Jesus, I acknowledge that you have a future in store for me, and I want to take hold of the redemption you're offering. So Jesus, I confess that I've messed up. I confess that I'm a sinner. Confess that I'm in need of you. Jesus, I ask today that you just come into my life. You would wash, wash my life clean, that I would be just consumed by your love and your grace and your mercy, that I would learn to just walk and step with your spirit and, and follow in obedience to your ways and, and your commands and your word. Jesus, I just ask you to come be a part of my life today. I believe that you are my Savior. You died for me and rose again. This redemption, this grace is real, and I choose to take hold of it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if that's you, we want to celebrate with you. What an amazing decision you've just made. Let someone know. Call our church office. Email us. Email us. Send us a message on Facebook or online. We want to just celebrate along with you this incredible decision that you have made to make Jesus a part of your life. Just as we had, before we had to communion, one more thing. I just, I want to pray for a few things we talked about today. So you just bow your heads with me as we wrap up today. God, I thank you for the incredible truth that we can find in your word. And as we look to a, a story that's very much removed from our practical circumstance, you know, it's rare that I wake up and you ask me to go walk around a walled city and see those walls come down. But God, each one of us wakes up every day and is faced with challenges or tests or circumstances that we're not really sure how we're going to make our way through. And there's one thing we can learn from today's text. It's this, that there is victory in obedience. So God, I pray for those of us today that are struggling with obedience, that are having a hard time to do the things that you are asking of us. God, I pray that today's word would encourage us to follow you. It would encourage us to obey what you're asking. Even when it might seem counter to what makes sense to us, that there is victory in obedience. So God, I pray that you would help each one, each and every one of us to walk in alignment with what you are asking of us, with what you are revealing to us in your word, with the, the ways and the patterns that you've laid out for us. God, would you help us to walk in obedience to you, knowing that there is a victory when we do so. And the second is this. I recognize there may be those of you who are watching today who are just feeling like the world is crumbling around you, that you are just sitting in a big pile of rubble. More than anything, I hope that you hear these words loud and clear. There is redemption in the rubble. God, I pray that for those who need to hear that, that, that message would be loud and clear, that they would tangibly see the grace that is offered. They would tangibly see the redemptive future you have in store for them. They would, be, they would find the strength in this moment to stand up, to pick themselves up, to grab hold of your hand, and to allow you to lead them and guide them into what you have for them next. Not looking to rebuild, not looking to have a pity party, not looking to just give up, 
but looking to walk forward into the redemptive future that you have in store for them. I ask this, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stay with us? Danny Hunt is up next. We're going to take communion together as a church. God bless you. What an amazing message by Pastor Danny. Certainly lots to think about, lots to chew on there. Um, It's certainly not lost on me, the uh, appropriateness of the passage of Jericho when we're doing communion today, because Danny's point about victory through obedience really ties into what we're thinking about today, what we are experiencing when we come to the communion table. Um, Communion is an act of obedience when we take it together as a church. We're following Jesus' command. He says, do this in remembrance of me when he's referring to the elements of communion, the body, the bread, uh, the blood, the wine, however you're choosing to partake this morning with whatever elements you happen to have. It's an act of obedience to something he asked us to do in remembrance of him. And of course, we are remembering his victory. The, the obedience that we're participating in now, recalling his victory on the cross. And of course, the elements that we're partaking in, the uh, bread or the cracker being broken as his body was broken, the juice representing the blood that he shed on the cross, a broken body and shed blood in any other context, it, it symbolizes defeat, But with Jesus, it symbolizes victory, his victory over death, his victory over sin, and the victory that he imparts to us uh, as we have faith in him, that grace that he gives us, the victory that he gives us so that we can have relationship with him and relationship with the Father. So as we join together in communion today, whether it's um, in person at the church building or whether it's uh, in the safety and the comfort of our own homes, wherever you are, let's remember his victory and let's be obedient to his commands. Now, whatever representation you have uh, of the body, whether it's bread, cracker, it doesn't matter. Just let's take it together. Let's break it in remembrance of him. And whenever you're ready, whatever you have uh, as the representation of the blood, you can take it now as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the victory that you won on the cross and that you give to us. Those of us who have faith in you, God, have been promised victory through you, God. And we take these elements in remembrance of you, Jesus. May you never be far from our minds and our hearts, God. Every day when we wake up, would we remember the victory that you've given us? And every night when we lay our heads down to rest, would we remember that we rest in the assurance of your goodness? of your grace, of your mercy, of your forgiveness, Lord Jesus. Those things are new every day for us. They are never taken from us, God, and we cannot be taken from you, and we thank you for that. And Lord Jesus, I pray that um, these experiences that we have, these Sunday morning moments, whether it's communion, whether it's worship, whether it's uh, taking in a message that's being read from your word, God, would you just over and through it all wash us with your Holy Spirit. Wash us with your presence, God, that this would be a time of renewing, a time of rebuilding, God, and that we would, um, together as a church, say we trust in uh, the Lord who gives us victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, We look forward to the time when we can see each other face to face. uh, And until then, be blessed. Mm -hmm.